Hey, my name's Caleb, and I'm the pastor at Cross of Life, and we're so thankful that you clicked on this video. We really pray that it benefits you, it grows your faith, or maybe introduces you to Jesus in a way that you've never been introduced before. But what we also want for you is to be connected to a local congregation. So if Cross of Life is your home congregation, we're glad that you make use of these resources, but make sure that this never comes in the place of coming together for worship with the body of believers. Let's be a church that values in-person gathering when so much of life is digital. And if you're somebody who's not from Mississauga, uh, get in touch with the local church in your area. It can be so easy to pick and choose, oh, I like this preacher or I like this message, but never actually invest in the place that Jesus says that he is, in his body, the church. And we encourage you to take time to put yourself into his body, in a local congregation, so that you can pray for one another, love one another, support one another, forgive one another, do all the things that the scripture talks about for one another. So we hope you're blessed by this video, and we hope that we get the chance to see you in person sometime soon. Once again, good morning and happy Easter to all of you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. The text that we're going to look at under the theme of resurrection reality is from John chapter 20, starting at verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that she had, he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. 
And today, under the theme of resurrection reality, we're going to look at three things about the resurrection that are real. The history, the humanity, and the hilarity of the resurrection. If you're following along with us and you have a notes sheet, uh, that's where you can take some notes on the sermon text today. If you don't have a notes sheet, there's no shame in going back on the music stand there and grabbing uh, a notes sheet to follow along. So we'll start by going through the history. As part of my preparation for this resurrection reality sermon, uh, I wanted to look into what you can see in AI-generated content that marks it as not real. But I think every one of us would agree that something that's AI-generated has a lack of reality to it. It's not human, right? So I was looking up the different things that you can see in AI-generated text or AI-generated images to notice whether they're real or not. And one of the things that uh, I found is true about AI-generated text is that AI-generated text is too perfect. It usually shows this by being very repetitive in the uh, turns of phrase or grammatical structures that it uses. Because from the computer's point of view, it's found the most perfect way to say whatever it's trying to say, and so it just repeatedly says it that way because, well, that's the most perfect way to say it. Human beings, we don't do that. We vary things up because we understand that saying things the exact same way over and over and over again is, well, kind of irritating. There's an idea about the story of Jesus' resurrection that this story was developed, it was curated over hundreds of years from the time that Jesus lived to fit into a narrative that would maintain power for fit, fit in whatever intersectional group you want, white men or something like this, so they could maintain power over all people. And so they they curated this story perfectly so that they would be the heroes and that everyone would listen to them. Now, AI didn't exist 2,000 years ago, but the premise is the same, that this story is too perfect. It fits in to somebody's idea of who Jesus is too perfectly. The problem is I just don't think the text bears that out. If you want to fill in a blank to start out with us today, I would say that the Easter story isn't perfect. And that's perfect. It's not perfect. You read it, and there are all sorts of things that stick out like sore thumbs in the text. Like, this is not perfectly curated like narrative to build an idea. It's, it's real history written down by real people who really saw it. Let me just show you a, a bunch of examples from this text. Right at the very beginning of the text, it says that Mary was going to the tomb. Why? Because she still thought Jesus was dead. I mean, why would you go to the tomb if you were a perfect believer that Jesus was going to come back to life in three days? I mean, he had said it multiple times in his life before he died. Why didn't Mary Magdalene understand? I mean, if you're writing a narrative to try to make yourself look like the most important, the smartest, the ones who get it, why would you write a story that says that you don't? Continue. A couple verses later, after Mary Magdalene sees that the tomb is empty, she tells Peter and John, and the text tells us that they were both running to the tomb, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Let me just ask you, what's the narrative value of that? Like, what is that trying to communicate spiritually to us? Nothing. It's just what happened. Why do you include that one disciple happens to have a little bit faster sprint speed than another one? Maybe because it's just what happened. And maybe because John, who's writing this text, wants to make sure that Peter knows forever and ever and ever that he's a little bit faster than he is. <laughs> Continue a few more verses down. It says that when they went into the tomb, they saw that the body wasn't there. And it says that John believed, but then it also includes that they didn't understand from Scripture. I mean, if you're going to be the leaders of this new fake Jesus movement where you're going to say that you all have to listen to us because we're the really smart people who knew Jesus, why would you write in your founding document, we don't get it sometimes? Maybe because they didn't get it sometimes. Maybe because they needed the Holy Spirit to lead them to truth. It wasn't so obvious to them because of their brilliance. And then what happens? Well, Peter and John, they just go home. Like, they don't, again, connect the dots. They, they don't think, oh, Christ is risen, obviously. Let's go find him. They say, well, the body's gone. I guess we go back to our normal life. And Mary's no better, right? Mary just sits outside the tomb crying. Like, she doesn't get it. She, she doesn't understand what's going on, neither from Scripture or from faith. 
And then when a man shows up who turns out to be uh, Jesus, she says, they've taken my Lord away and I don't know where they have put him. And when she sees Jesus, it also tells us that she didn't realize that it was Jesus. Again, if you're supposed to be the insightful one, the one who is going to lead people into all truth in your new fake religion that you made up, why would you make yourself look the idiot in this story? Oh, and let's just pile on top of this that the first person to see Jesus, to actually testify to his resurrection, in fact, the only person for at least 12 hours of that day who knew Jesus was alive because they had seen him in the flesh was a woman. Which doesn't seem that remarkable to us, but in their culture was very remarkable. Because to them, a woman's testimony was not admissible evidence in a court of law. And so if you're writing your new fake Jesus story about how Jesus is is still alive and you should listen to us, why would you write it with an uncredible witness as the first person to see Jesus? I mean, if you're making up a story and you want it to be believable, a man is the first person who sees Jesus. But that's not what John writes. Maybe because... That's what actually happened. And then it continues. Toward the end of this text, we find out the disciples that same night are still hiding. They don't believe that Jesus is alive. They're afraid that people are going to come and kill them. And then when Jesus shows up to Thomas, or excuse me, when when Jesus shows up to the disciples and Thomas is not there, Thomas will not believe his friends. It says that they tell him, we have seen the Lord, but he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his excuse me, side, I will not believe. Again, incredulous. These guys who are supposed to be the leaders of the early Christian church, page after page, paragraph after paragraph, look like morons. They don't get any of it. And then, we didn't read this text, but as you continue into chapter 21, which comes after this, you get this really obscure narrative, which has a purpose, but as you read it, you think to yourself, what is this doing here? If you look in chapter 21... Jesus meets his disciples on the beach while they're fishing, and Jesus says, bring some of the fish you caught so that I can make breakfast for you. And the text tells us that Peter climbed back into his boat, dragged the net ashore, and it was full of large fish, 153. Why 153? What's the symbolic meaning of that 153? There is none. It's just the number of fish that was caught. This is just how you write down history. And of course, Jesus comes and tells them they can have breakfast, but none of them finally ask him who he was because they figured it out. This, st- this story is not written like a narrative crafted to hold on to some power or some worldview. It's crafted like real history. Now, someone might say, but I've read realistic narrative before, like fiction that, that seems real. I've read that before. In the 21st century, you have. But that genre of literature didn't exist till more than a thousand years after Jesus' disciples were living. They were writing, if it's a fake story, a genre that did not exist and would not exist for literally a thousand years. Maybe they weren't making it up. Maybe they just wrote down what they saw because it's what happened. The resurrection is real history. And we need to say that. Because I think for a lot of people, even those who would call themselves Christians, they would say, well, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead, but it's it's like a spiritual resurrection. It's supposed to symbolize how we come out of the ashes of the troubles and difficulties of our lives. No. It's real history. It really happened. A man who said he was God said he would die for our sins and prove it by rising from the dead, and then he did it. And Paul, from 1 Corinthians 15, that same chapter will be read, that if Christ has not raised your faith, is futile, says, literally thousands of people saw him alive, and you can go talk to them. They're still alive. They've seen Christ. Eyewitness testimony. This is real history. It doesn't mean you have to believe that it's real history, but it does mean that you have to take it as what these authors really think they saw. And explain, then, why they wrote it the way that they wrote it. And frankly, all explanations besides, this is what really happened, fall short. But I'm guessing that's not enough. Because the truth is, for most people, evidence is not enough to convince them. Uh, Let me give you an example. If you take one of your most deeply held ideological, sociological, political beliefs, it can be something about 
politics that's happening right now or happened over the past couple years. It could be something about how you organize a family or raise your kids or spend your money or spend your time or, or anything like that. One of your most deeply held beliefs. And someone came to you and said, there's overwhelming evidence, like undeniable evidence that that view of things is wrong. And then they showed you all the evidence. How many of you would quite quickly say, oh yes, of course, the evidence says that I am wrong, so I will just completely change everything about my life. Most of us wouldn't do that. Because there's a whole lot of emotion and there's a whole lot of humanity behind the things that we believe. We don't just believe things because the evidence says so. We believe things because we're part of a community that believes those same things and that supports us and loves us in believing those same things. Which brings us to the humanity of the resurrection. See, the Bible doesn't just present us a historical narrative and say, okay, buy in. This is what it is. Live with it. That would be enough, but that's not what it offers us. It offers us not just the truth, but a humanity behind that truth. The first thing to notice, of course, is that Jesus rose from the dead as a human. He didn't spiritually rise. He physically rose with a body just like mine or yours to promise you that you're going to live forever in a perfected version of the body that you are currently inhabiting right now. And no other worldview offers you that. Every other worldview offers you some sort of compensation for your trouble in this world with a spiritualized afterlife where maybe you're in the spirit realm or you get absorbed into the all soul or something like this. But only Christianity says, no, life is going to be restored. Life is going to be the way it was always meant to be with you in your perfected body. No more pain or illness or mental struggle. No more tears or death. All of it gone. Restored, resurrected just like Jesus' body is resurrected. But then that human body, Jesus, shows great humanity. You can see in how uh, Jesus interacts with Mary. He shows that though evidence is necessary, evidence alone does not convince someone. Right? He's, he could have just left the tomb empty and expected that Mary and the disciples would have figured it out and eventually seen him, but he shows up with humanity to help them believe. Look what happens. Mary is there crying outside the tomb. She turns around and she sees Jesus standing there, but she doesn't realize it's Jesus. He asks her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And she thinks he's the gardener. So she says, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And then Jesus says to her, Mary. And that's the moment. He calls her by name and that's when she gets it. Now, it's not that she would just recognize anybody who would call her by name. In fact, if somebody did that to you here, somebody you never met, and they call you by name, you'd say, do I know you? But as soon as Jesus calls her by name, she recognizes who it is. And this teaches us something about Jesus, that Jesus knows you, and that's really important. Jesus knows you, everything about you, more than just your name. He knows your past, your present, your future, everything you've thought, said, or done. He knows all of it, and he comes to you and calls you by name. He calls you by name in baptism. He calls you by name at the Lord's Supper. He calls you by name when I stand up here and forgive your sins. He knows you. And the things that you wish you could forget, he has forgotten because he knows you and forgives you. The things that you're going through and keep you up at night, he sees as only minor setbacks on the road to eternity because he knows you and knows what you need. We see that actually in the the, tr the contrast between how Jesus treats Mary and how he treats Thomas. Did you see this? When Mary sees Jesus, Jesus says to her, don't hold on to me. Right? He says, don't touch me, don't grab me, don't hug me. But to Thomas, he says, put your finger here. See my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Why the two different ways of dealing with Mary and Thomas? Because he knew that they were different people and that they needed different things. And the same is true for every one of you. Every one of you is going to hear the exact same words today if you're listening to my voice. But every one of you is going to have those words hit you in a different way because your life is different, your personality is different, your background is different, what you're struggling with is different. It's not that the words change, it's not that the truths change, but that Jesus speaks to you through me because Jesus knows you and knows what you need. He knows what you need. You may not have told anybody, but he knows. 
You may struggle to get the words out without tears, but he knows. You may not know what the next step is, but he does. Jesus knows you and what you need and gives you what you need. But if you're a thinking person, you might say, okay, that sounds really nice and humane, but I haven't seen Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus isn't giving me the things that I need with his hands, looking me in the eye. How can you say that this is the humanity of Jesus that's supposed to support, support the evidence? Well, I think Jesus gives us insight into that as well. Notice that when Jesus comes back to life and he's talking to Mary, he says, don't hold on to me for I've not yet ascended to the Father, but go instead and tell my brothers. He doesn't say, don't worry about it, I'm going to catch up with those guys later. He doesn't say, one sec, and then transports all the way there, tells them and comes back. He says, go tell my brothers. And so far as I can tell, because this is super early in the morning where Jesus rises from the dead, and the text tells us that he doesn't show up to his disciples until the evening, there's at least about 12 hours between this moment and when Jesus shows up to the disciples. Who did Jesus send to show his presence? Mary. And while I would love to believe that because the rest of the Christian movement has dignified women in a way that no other worldview has ever done, that those disciples were just so overjoyed to listen to Mary tell them, but it seems like maybe they had some trouble believing her. Right? They locked themselves in the room, still afraid of the Jewish leaders. They didn't necessarily like the message that Mary was bringing. Maybe it was something about Mary, who knows? But that's how Jesus wanted it. Jesus is going to show up to you not by some magical vision or divine zap of a lightning bolt to fix everything in your life. Jesus knows you and what you need, and he's going to give it to you in your Christian family. He's going to give it through real people. Look, you may not like me or trust me or dislike something about the way that I look or that I talk or what I do. Maybe the kind of relationship that Mary had with the other disciples. Sure, we, we like her, but... I mean, can we really trust her? But that's who Jesus sent. And it's not just me. It's maybe people in your family who don't really like to hear this message from. You don't like it when grandma makes you come to church or when mom tells you that you have to pray before you eat. Or, or you might not like it when your friend brings up Jesus again. But that's who Jesus sent. Because that's how Jesus works. Jesus is human, and Jesus sends humans to meet humans. Because he knows you need more than evidence. You need a community that is going to gather around you and know you. And so my invitation is, first of all, to those of you who are not part of our church family. There are many of you who are sitting here who Cross of Life is not your church home. We want to be your family. We want to be the ones who bring Jesus to you, both in his word and in his sacraments and in the daily needs that you have as you struggle through this veil of tears. We want that for you, and we invite you to take the next step toward that, which is to meet with me and talk about how that path looks. But then also for those of you who call Cross of Life your church home, that we would see ourselves as the place where we receive Christ. That Christ is not some disembodied idea, some system of beliefs that we take in, not some information that we download into our brains, but an experience of human beings because Christ came and rose as a human being and sends human beings to be human. It reminds me of the story of Samuel Do You know this man? He wrote one of the most famous Easter hymns. We actually sang it earlier today in our Easter vigil, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. Samuel Medley lived about 250 years ago, almost exactly, and he was part of the British Royal Navy. He was in a battle and was very badly wounded in one of his legs, and so he had to take months of recovery time. Samuel Medley had grown up a Christian, but early in his life had rejected the whole thing. It seemed really kind of foolish to him and didn't have much practical value. He ran away from his family's faith. But when he was stuck in recovery, laying in a bed, waiting for his leg to heal, his grandfather came to him and would read him the Bible and would read him sermons and would pray for him. And it was in that moment that Samuel Medley came back to the faith. It wasn't that the teachings had changed. It wasn't that Jesus had changed. It was that a human being showed up. It was that a human being spent time with a man who could do nothing. Maybe that's how the faith works. Maybe Jesus sends human beings to human beings 
Not because the evidence has changed, but because part of believing is having a community to live with. Samuel Medley went on to write many Christian hymns, including, I know that my Redeemer lives. What a thing for a man who threw away the faith to say. And yet he believed because of the humanity of Jesus embodied in his grandfather. So it's true, it's real, and it's hilarious. <laughs> the hilarity of the resurrection is the last point we're going to talk about today. What does it mean if something is hilarious? I think we have probably a, an idea of just like overwhelming happiness, and that's probably fine enough in our English terminology, but the word comes actually from the Greek word hilarus, which means cheerful or happy. That word hilarious really means something more like a, a base level cheerfulness. But what's interesting about the word hilarus, where hilarity or hilarious comes from, is that it has this idea of spontaneity or adventure or surprise in your cheerfulness. Maybe to put flesh on this idea for you. Um, like if you wake up tomorrow morning and your refrigerator is still running, are you going to be cheerful about that? No, right? It's just the thing doing the thing that it's supposed to do. But what if tomorrow your refrigerator breaks down and you're a little bit worried about the food that you have in there going bad and so you call up the handyman and he's like, it's Easter Monday, I don't work. And you're like, my fridge is broken. Can you please come over? And so he finally comes over and then there's that moment where he says, I think I got it working. You'd be pretty happy about your refrigerator running at that point <laughs> because there's surprise, there's adventure, there's spontaneity, there's uncertainty in that moment. That's the idea behind hilarus, hilarity. We get some of that in the Jesus narrative, the resurrection of Jesus narrative, and I think it's exactly what we need because I think deep down, every one of us understands that the world cannot work perfectly all the time. We understand that there is uncertainty, there is adventure, there is a higher calling to life. And the perfectly curated, works every time life that the modern world is trying to offer to us is dissatisfying. There's a reason we have things called midlife crises. Maybe to help you envision this, I want you to think of the 1999, 1999 film, The Matrix. You remember this film? I can't recommend everything about the film, but there's this really interesting scene where uh, an agent, so in the, the narrative, he's a computer program. He's speaking to a human being, Morpheus, and he's talking about how Morpheus is plugged in to a computer program called The Matrix. And he says, did you know that the first Matrix was designed to be the perfect human world where none suffered, where everyone would be happy? It was a disaster. No one would accept the program. Entire crops were lost. Some, he's talking about the computers, some computers believed we lacked the programming knowledge to describe your perfect world. But I believe, as a species, human beings define their reality through suffering and misery. You understand what he's saying? We realize the world's not perfect. We realize there's a bigger story. We realize that things don't work the way that they should, but they should. And I think that's exactly what the resurrection narrative offers us. It offers us the hilarious, cheerful, surprising adventure that the world actually can work right against all odds, in the face of all uncertainty. The hilarity of the resurrection is this. First, Jesus rose from the dead. That's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, that is surprising. That is unexpected. That is not the way things work. And if you're here sitting as one who believes that Jesus rose from the dead, you believe something crazy. Now, you believe it probably because of history and probably because of humanity, but you still believe something crazy. You believe that there is a world beyond this world, that something bigger is happening here than what you see with your eyes, that life doesn't have to be the way that it is, that it can be different. But there's an even deeper hilarity to the resurrection narrative, and that's that Jesus rose from the dead for you. It isn't just history for us to check a box and say, we know what happened, it's history that invades our life and says that because Jesus lives, you also can live. Because Jesus lives, all of the bad that you experience is going to be taken away. Because Jesus lives, every tear will be wiped away from your eye. Every morning will become a joyful song. Every bit of pain will turn into pleasure. This is for you. And that's hilarious. 
I mean, you, little old you, little old me in the 21st century living in Canada, that we're going to believe that some Jewish guy died and rose again, and that means everything for us? Yeah, because it's real, and it happened, and it's for you. And it satisfies the deepest longing of our hearts that this world is bigger than what we experience. We try to find it in love. We try to find it in a movie or a video game or some form of entertainment. We try to find that fantasy experience where things work out. The real world is not like that unless Jesus rose from the dead. The hilarity or the hilarus of the gospel is not just that Jesus rose from the dead, but Jesus rose from the dead for you. And the biblical authors understand that deeply. In fact, they took this word hilarus and they used another word related to it, hilasterion, to describe the place where God's mercy happens. And you find it throughout the Bible, the hilasterion. In fact, many Greek translators will just leave it that way. It's almost like a proper noun for them. The hilarious nature of the Christian faith is that sinners are forgiven, that people who are dying will live, that people who are corrupt will find perfection. That's what's on offer from Jesus. He's done the work. He offers it to you for free. He says, believe in me. And like John says, that will be enough for you to live because you see that Jesus is the Messiah. So let me finish with one more pop culture reference. Uh, Same time frame as The Matrix, the late 90s, a movie called Shakespeare in Love came out. How many of you saw Shakespeare in Love? Not that many, that's okay. That'll mean the story will be more surprising for many of you. Uh, Shakespeare in Love is a movie that's set in this context of um, theater productions, and the plague has stopped all of the theater productions. And so the people who have invested uh, money in the theater are now losing money hand over fist. And so there's a character, Mr. Fennyman, who's one of the investors, who is going to rough up or maybe even torture or kill this character named Henslow, who owes him the money. And the the interaction goes like this. Uh, Henslow says to Mr. Fennyman, Mr. Fennyman, let me explain to you about the theater business. The natural condition is one of insurmountable obstacles on on the road to imminent disaster. Believe me, To be closed by the plague is a bagatelle in the ups and downs of owning a theater. Fennyman answers, so what do we do? Henslow answers, nothing. Strangely enough, it all turns out well. How? asks Fennyman. And Henslow says, I don't know. It's a mystery. Does your life feel like that? Maybe you can relate with this. If you've been in theater before, you know you're like one week to production and nothing seems like it's in place and it's, it's insurmountable obstacles on a road to imminent disaster. But somehow, the night comes and you produce the show and it's beautiful and everyone loves it. Some of you haven't been in theater, but you know your life feels like that. It feels like insurmountable obstacles on the road to imminent disaster. And you want it to turn out well, but it's not the theater business. It's real life. And you don't have that sense that it's going to turn out well. Unless, of course, Jesus is risen. The last part of this uh, scene in the movie, after Henslow says, I don't know, it's a mystery, is the bell of the messenger rings. And the messenger says, the theaters are reopened. It's hilarious. (laughs) That one moment when everything turns, when everything fits, when everything is fixed, When it feels like insurmountable um, obstacles on the road to imminent disaster turns into a straight and flat path. This is what Jesus offers you. The chance to see your life, whether it's health or family or it's relationships that feel like insurmountable obstacles on a road to imminent disaster, you can know that because Christ is risen, they will all become a straight and clean path. That Christ will right all wrongs, that he will undo all evil, that he will make all death swallow up in victory for you. So let me ask you the question. What if it's real? What if it's not just a story we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better about ourselves? What if it's not something we spiritualize and say, well, maybe it happened or maybe it didn't, but it doesn't matter. The point is that, what if we said a real man really came back to life? And because he did and because he's God, I too can live. You would be almost the full resurrection version of yourself, wouldn't you? A person who lives without fear because you don't have to be scared of death. 
A person who lives not having to live for themselves because you've been given everything in Christ already? A person who can be patient and not have to extract from other people because Christ is all in all to you? I mean, this body won't live forever, but you could get pretty close if you believed that it was real. Friends, it is. It's real, it's human, and it's for you. So believe it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, today, as we gather around your word one more time to hear this resurrection narrative, help it seep deep into our hearts through your Holy Spirit and through the community that gathers around this word. Because we know our sinful hearts, our corrupt hearts, do not want to believe it. We want to believe that you are our enemy, that you want something from us, not something for us. Soften our hearts. Gather us with one another around that word to once again remind us that we have nothing to fear. Death is no longer our enemy. Satan no longer owns us. Sin is no longer on our record. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.